welcome to Money, 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 your weekly personal finance date with me, Surabhi Upadhyay. Mutual funds are definitely becoming the investment vehicle of choice for the retail investor. However, while we all know the benefits of investing via these funds, are we aware of the fine print that comes with them? Do we know our rights as an investor? Well, Feroz Aziz of Anandrati Private Wealth joins me on the show this week to demystify exactly some of those very important elements. Feroz, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Thanks for taking out the time. I'm going to start with a very basic thought that always crosses the mind, you know. Uh, you have independent advisors that are out there telling you which fund to buy. You have your bank relationship manager which is willing to offer you all kinds of investment advice. Uh, and then of course there are standalone, you know, NBFC, standalone financial institutions like of course Anandrati. Uh, so I just want to understand what is the setup like, this advisory business and people who are advising clients on which fund to buy. How does it work? See, yeah, yeah, like you rightly said, mm. there is a lot of people who are offering the advice. Mm. Some are offering transactions, some are offering products, some are offering advice. Mm. But it's quite a cluttered kind of a space. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, if one has to choose an advisor, first he has to be very clear of what is the attributes he's looking for in an advisor. Okay? In my opinion, there are three things uh, which are very, very important attributes of an advisor, which one should if not at the starting, would be able to gauge over a period of time of interaction for him to see whether he can live his life taking advice from that guy. Mm. One is the capability of the person, commitment and the element of trust. So these are the three aspects, capability, commitment and trust mm. are the three things which one should look for uh, in trying to find an advisor. Mm. See, if you're buying products from one, uh, then you don't have to actually dwell, dwell deep into what that kind of person is, is he. But mm. if it's advice, then you need to really dig deep and figure out whether he'll be able to give me the advice. Okay, fair enough. But uh, what is the current structure? I think now uh, the regulator has made it clear that in case an investor wants to know the fee structure or the commission structure, then the asset management company has to come clear on this, right? Absolutely. Actually, uh, this rule of commission disclosure was there for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, generally, people would not disclose it when you're doing the transaction. They would disclose it on a website or, or some, somewhere in, in some corner where, where the investor is actually not trying not to not looking, yeah. looking. But mm -hmm. recently, SEBI also mandated it uh, to be compulsory for a person to actually disclose the commission during the transaction. Okay. And also, the asset management companies will now be mandated to send the commission not just as a percentage but also in rupees on a on a six monthly basis to the so investor to the investor okay so your account statements mm -hmm. which are received by the investor are going to read the rupee value of the commission paid to your distributor or your advisor Oh, this is very interesting. Uh, are these disclosures already being made or is this still work in progress? So this uh, has uh, started from this October, as, as latest as this October. Uh, so the October statement uh, of the half yearly October statement would actually read the commissions which your, which your distributor or advisor has made uh, in rupee terms. And how are these commissions being paid? Is it per transaction? Is it per folio uh, that uh, you know, an advisor or a, a seller or a distributor gets on board? See, uh, I think it's a very pertinent question, mm -hmm. Surabhi. Uh, how is my advisor being remunerated? Okay, it actually is very important for you to understand as a client uh, how he's being re remunerated so that you can understand if there's any biased advice reaching you uh, and any kind of uh, vested interest uh, being factored in, in the advice. So there are two types of commissions which can be paid to an MF distributor, mutual fund distributor. 90% uh, of them actually opt uh, for a not so good kind of a commission structure from a client's perspective, which is called the upfront commission. When an investor invests, the person who actually deposits the uh, investment gets mm -hmm. a commission upfront for the investment made. And typically, what are the ranges? How does it vary? See, it varies according to fund category. Mm -hmm. Generally, uh, for you to understand that, it will be 60 70 percent of the expense ratio. Okay. So, in an equity mutual fund, it would range between uh, 1%, uh, 0 0.8 to 1%, okay. uh, and, and uh, in debt funds it could be marginally lower. So that's paid upfront the moment I as an investor sign up uh, and take on a folio? Absolutely. Okay. So what's the second model? The second model is, uh, where seldom do people opt for it as organizations and mm. advisors, is to say that you would get a trail commission, the nomenclature used is trail commission, by which I mean however long the investor stays invested, you get a percentage, a small percentage of the market value of the investment. Okay. Uh, so if one person has invested one lakh rupee, you don't get anything on the day when the client invests. You get a percentage every month 
month, mm -hmm. depending on whether he stayed invested for that period of that month or not. So if he stayed invested for 15 days out of the one year, if he chose to invest only for 15 days, the commission stops after 15 days. Okay. And if the value of the portfolio increases in terms of market value, your commission also grow up. And then, then typically what sort of ranges are we talking about in this particular format? Uh, see, this, this is marginally lower and uh, it can range between 0.6 to 0.9% mm -hmm. uh, generally. Marginally lower, but unfortunately it does not pay you up front. If the client pulls out the money, uh, then the commission stops, uh, even if it's one month commission. So it's the percentage which I told you was per annum. Uh, so per annum if it's 0.6 to 0.9, uh, and if the value grows, uh, the value, the percentage is not of the initial capital, but also the market value. Okay. So it seems to me that obviously the trail commission model seems to be a little more friendly as far as the investor is concerned, because there the commission is linked to the longevity perhaps of the investment, the returns, and it's not linked to the you know per transaction value or every time that you're churning your portfolio, right? Correct. Absolutely. I think uh, the trail commission, uh, the client and the advisor are on the same side of the table. Mm -hmm. Because if my client's wealth doubles, my commission doubles. Uh, in an upfront commission model, I'm always in the lookout for trying to make a transaction so that I make some money out of it as an advisor. So an upfront commission model creates a behavioral pattern uh, for you to give advice which is m not, not maybe the best advice because one fund would probably do bad for a couple of months and the advisor is latching on to that bad performance and moving the money from one place to another to get the upfront commission again on which he has already earned some time back. So this was a large phenomena in India. Uh, trail commissions were absolutely not pro, uh, not popular. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years back uh, there was an analysis done on the mutual fund folios and then you realized equity folios were being held for not more than 10 to 12, 13 months mm -hmm. uh, because the advisor would actually be motivated to make the transaction happen. That's very interesting. So definitely trail commission seems to be the friendlier bet. Um, is it now more uh, widely accepted? What sort of distributors are opting for this model? Because from an investor's point of view, you want to perhaps be with advisors who are willing to consider this model. Correct. Absolutely. You see, what happens is uh, the entire organized setup of large large setups especially have large costs already incurred and committed. Mm. Uh, so moving to a trail model uh, for large NBFCs or large banks has become a very uphill task because they have already have costs. Mm. Uh, but I think if somebody is going to be long-term greedy rather than short-term greedy as a wealth management outfit, uh, they would opt for it. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, there are very few. Uh, we have... To, uh, Probably at least Anand Rathi has uh, chosen to opt for a trail commission and we okay. have given away all upfront commissions so that uh, no no unsolicited, unrequired advice goes to the client and move the churning, which mm. was a phenomenon, which was mm. a huge concern for regulator, gets addressed mm. proactively rather than reactively. Well, very important points here. and I think the first takeaway is at least investors need to start asking the right questions. Ask your advisor what is the model that he or she is following and then see whether it suits your interests or not. Let's take a break on that. But when we come back, this conversation continues. There are lots of other important fine elements relating with your mutual fund investments. We will discuss them on the other side. Welcome back here with Money, Money, Money. And this week, we are discussing the fine print of mutual fund investing. What are the rules and regulations you should be aware of? And what are your rights as a mutual fund investor? Feroz, now let's talk about a scenario where an asset management company is bought over by, by another company. Uh, so what happens then? I mean, all the schemes directly move to the, uh, to the buyer. And then therefore, if I am one of the investors, I also have to migrate? Uh, there, are, there are different situations where promoter holdings can change. One mm -hmm. is a takeover, complete takeover, complete change of name. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is a merger uh, between two asset management companies to form a one, one of them. And then they, they co-collaborate and have used the names and the brands. And the third is where one, one, uh, one of the partners or one of the owner, owners mm -hmm. or, the, uh, or, or a promoter is increasing or decreasing his stake. In either of these cases, uh, the investors' rights uh, change dramatically during this transition phase okay. uh, so of 30 days. Uh, so, so, so 
all these three situations require some degree of vigilance mm -hmm. uh, in this transfer transition phase for an investor across a couple of items uh, so I think it's an important aspect which you're bringing so, up. So take us through the fine print what happens in each case then? Uh, so so in all the three cases one right you get is that you can exit any of the schemes uh, invested in any of the two AMC's if they're being merged mm -hmm. or in one of the AMC's which is being taken over without an exit load. Generally most schemes today at least 80-85% of the schemes which are not liquid schemes have an exit load in which you invest. Mm -hmm. Equity schemes have an exit load of one year. Debt, debt uh, schemes have an exit load of three years, more or less. Okay. There could be exceptions though. If uh, you've just spent two years and you have one more year to go in a debt scheme and if there's actually a promoter holding change due to merger, takeover or an ex increase or mm -hmm. decrease in sale, you get an exit free exit from that scheme. Okay. So you can actually move out of under performing schemes uh, in case of takeover merger happens without paying the exit load that's one okay uh, so that's that's worked wonders for people because uh, and this is not a very rare phenomena because at any point in time every financial year over the last three four financial years at least three to four asset management companies have gone through this process that's a very interesting point uh, speaking of exits uh, there are uh, you know exit loads as you mentioned which are still in play there are no entry loads. They have been banned by the regulator quite a few years back, right? So is there any other sort of uh, charge that one needs to be aware of when it comes to mutual funds? Yes, I think uh, very importantly, this is a fine print which little do people know that August 2009 is when entry load was actually abolished. Mm -hmm. uh, since entry load was abolished, uh, the entry loads are not to be taken. but systematic investment plans which is the most popular method of investing in mutual funds mm -hmm. where, a, where an individual invests on a monthly basis SIPs or systematic investment plans any systematic investment plan which was started before August 2009 mm -hmm. is still attracting an exit entry load today uh, so if you're paying your monthly uh, invest investment limit uh, for an SIP which started before 2009, you're still paying an entry load to absolutely, the AMC. Absolutely. Wow, that, that's, that's an amazing insight that I don't know if all people would be aware of. Correct. Mm -hmm. SIP is a very recurring long-term investment plan. So yeah. it quite happens that you've made an SIP uh, commitment in 2005. And, and you've continue. forgotten about it because it was part of your ELSS planning and maybe it's just continuing without much of a thought. Correct. So, yeah. so anybody who has a 20,000 rupee SIP uh, in the last six years has lost out 60,000 rupees because of entry loads because he's doing 20,000 rupees every month. Uh, and and if, what is the, the charge that's being levied? How, how big is this entry load on these 2.25 percent. Okay so the, pre the, the previous rate of 2.25 percent continues. Yeah. Okay. So, it's so what's, what's the option now? What's the solution then? Yeah the solution is uh, you will have to once actually give a closure to your systematic investment plan and reinstate in the same scheme. If you like the scheme you can continue investing in the same scheme but doing extra documentation if it can save you five six thousand rupees a year uh, on cost which is very very good I think uh, just one degree of uh, documentation one time uh, closing the old SIP and mm -hmm. reinstating it will actually do the trick extremely important so if you've got any pre 2009 SIPs please go back take a look and you might want to make the changes that Feroz is recommending Feroz very quick last point expense ratios the basic management fee that an EMC is of course entitled to charge a uh, simple question here that uh, are they fairly reasonable and are they fairly uniform across the different asset management houses and how do they vary between equity and debt schemes? See, expense ratios actually are quite uh, diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at equity category, uh, as the scheme becomes bigger, uh, the expense ratio chargeable permitted uh, by the regulator is reduces significantly. So small schemes are more expensive generally and the large schemes are cheaper. Mm -hmm. Okay, some asset management companies uh, publish their expense ratios including service tax mm -hmm. and some don't. So okay. you'll have to be very careful when you're comparing two expense ratios because it could be apples and orange comparison because 15 percent difference could be there due to pre uh, ex, service, ex tax service tax and, and with service, with service tax, tax. Yeah, yeah. so if to, when you're comparing expense ratios of all lesson management companies please uh, you'll have to check whether it includes uh, service tax half of them actually mm -hmm. include service tax and half of them don't but generally you're saying rule of thumb that the bigger the scheme
time, the bigger the size of the fund, typically lesser the expense ratio. Yes, because the regulator actually puts a cap on how much you can charge mm -hmm. beyond a certain threshold of assets collected. The first few crores uh, is the most, uh, expensive, most expensive and then the scheme becomes a 10,000 crore scheme. Mm -hmm. Then you have a lesser expense automatically which is clamped down by the regulator okay. itself. And, and this would apply to both equity, this basic thumb rule of bigger the fund, lesser the expense ratio, this would apply to equity and debt funds? Not necessarily because okay. uh, most often than not the limit of debt funds expense ratio is never utilized mm -hmm. because uh, there's very little uh, scope for for expense in a debt scheme because uh, nine nine and a half percent eight percent is the return mm -hmm. right so expenses generally uh, are very very uh, even a small scheme could be significantly lower uh, lower on expense than a bigger scheme in the debt, debt side all right, fair enough. Lots of interesting points coming up over there. We'll take a break, but on the other side, again, a very important element. What happens if you've forgotten about an investment and an old folio number suddenly comes to you? How do you go about claiming all of those forgotten investments, those forgotten dividends? We'll talk about that on the other side of the break. Welcome back. You're with Money, Money, Money. And this week we're talking about the fine print when it comes to your mutual fund investments. So, Firoz, we've spoken about a lot of interesting things, in, including churn, the commission model, etc. Uh, now, let's talk about forgotten investments. There might be, you know, the, the odd folio, the odd ELSS scheme that you started at some point, forgot, maybe you didn't update your KYC details. What can an investor do to retrieve some of these investments? See, uh, in the journey of investing, mm -hmm. it generally happens some small investments investments get left out mm -hmm. uh, because it's said that almost about 10 to 12,000 crores out of the 16 lakh crore industry of mutual funds uh, this 10,000 12,000 crores don't have uh, the right addresses right uh, uh, PAN numbers right bank account details oh. so these are not traceable so there is uh, currently a mechanism uh, with the depository uh, to search and get a consolidated statement uh, from NSDL uh, and CDSL which are depositories so retrieving that statement uh, uh, for your for your own names they do a name search and figure out and then come to a narrow narrower band of identical names and mm -hmm. then they use email id to filter it down so you can actually do an audit uh, to figure out whether there is any contribution of this unclaimed money of yours which is by the virtue of having invested uh, in small amounts long back so i mean as an investor if you suddenly remember that okay there was that odd scheme um, uh, which perhaps you're not contributing to anymore, but it's an old investment. Uh, then can you approach the AMC directly? Should you be approach approaching the depository? See, when mm -hmm. you have forgotten of a folio in mm -hmm. mutual fund, unlike a bank account, it mm -hmm. does not go dormant. Mm -hmm. Okay, it remains alive till the scheme remains alive. Okay. So an investor does not have to do anything different uh, to actually get the money which he has forgotten of. He just discovers it and in a normal course can redeem it, add more, subtract whatever he wishes okay. to do. Okay. It's only that if you don't know the folio number mm -hmm. of the investment and you vaguely remember that I actually invested 20,000 but I don't know which asset management company because there are 42, 43 asset management companies. Mm -hmm. You can't, if you don't remember the scheme mm -hmm. uh, or the fund house name or the fund house now has changed the promoter and the name yeah. itself has changed. Yeah. It's happened quite a, quite a few and times. And therefore the scheme may not uh, exist, exist any longer. Exist any longer. Mm -hmm. Then you will have to use your PAN number, your email ID, your name mm -hmm. uh, to do a search with a depository NSTL. Uh, so you can send an email uh, to the registered mail ID of NSTL and they send you a consolidated statement across different advisors, mm -hmm. uh, different time frames, 42 asset management companies all put together, all DMAT accounts put together, they give you a consolidated statement. Now that's fantastic. The, the depositories are willing to go out there and, you know, give you all that information as long as an investor can be a little aware and is willing to go the extra mile to, to reclaim, to trace that investment. That brings us to the last thoughts on, on this subject and that is a grievance redressal. Uh, what sort of grievances typically come up and that you might have encountered uh, and what is the way to have them addressed? I think there are uh, largely, if you if you categorize complaints of investors, they fall into two or three categories. One is that the scheme has not been sold with the right risk profile in mind of the investor, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the risks have not been highlighted, and there's a mismatch between the expectation and the risk of risk return profile of the scheme, mm -hmm. uh, which generally uh, has been addressed by the color coding which the regulator has indicated, so that if an investor is aware, but I meet so many investors. Uh, and they don't know what 
colors signify. So mm. it's important for an investor before he starts investing in mutual funds, understands the color coding and then uh, categorizes each scheme as per the risk. Okay, all right. So in case uh, there are any of these issues, um, whom should the investor approach? Should he take it up with the AMC? In which case, with, can the AMC just wash its hands off and say that, you know, that's uh, between you and the distributor? No, what happens mm -hmm. is there is, uh, SEBI has actually, uh, like you have the ombudsman uh, for banks, mm -hmm. there's courts, uh, which is the set-up entity, uh, which the regulator set up for any complaints on mutual funds uh, or its distributors as well. Uh, so if there is a mis-selling, uh, if there is a service issue with an asset management company, if, if there is uh, some dividends which, which have not reached you on time and mm -hmm. you're making a claim on them because mm -hmm. they didn't uh, deposit the dividend in your in account, your account yeah. there could be several reasons why you have uh, a grievance with either the asset management company or the distributor who gave you that scheme. Scores becomes your one one stop shop to uh, to put put up all the complaints and get them addressed and okay. you can track them online your complaint status scores yeah scores and you can approach and register a complaint online or do you Absolute. have to drop in a letter no uh, the good part is logistically it's not so difficult you can you can put up a complaint online and uh, the technological support and the platform is reasonably good if you actually explored that platform all right, Feroz, fantastic. Thank you so much. And this is very helpful. It uh, demystifies a lot of the fine print elements that nobody really wants to read because, you know, it's easier to listen to it uh, from an expert like yourself than to go through the fine print. Thanks very much. Very helpful. All right, that's where we take your leave on this week's edition of Money, Money, Money. Any feedback, questions, queries, welcome. As always, we'll see you again next week.